Now, I had just basically mentioned to you, Doug, that I can't see how ecumenism uh, can take place when Rome is in a situation where doctrinally, theologically, dogmatically, uh, she cannot change. Uh, that would mean that anyone who would unite with her would have to accept her teaching. Uh, and that does not look like ecumenism to me. It looks like absorption. How would you respond to that? Well, let me first just say, with regard to your previous comment, that I also have a booklet that people might be interested in. It's called Apologetics Without Apology. And if anybody wants that, they can write to me without... And I'll give it to them from the station here. <coughs> it's not my own book, but I use it. Oh, okay. Also... I'm presently teaching at Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church, and one of the, the name of my course right now is called Catholics, Lutherans, the Bible, and the Pope, because you know the Pope is coming to the Valley this coming fall. But anyway, to get back to the point that you were talking about, one of the things that has to be done in terms of ecumenism is to take the capital letters off of the word Catholic, and that is really if you've studied the creeds, as you said, you've had, you know that Catholic is not a word that initially was capitalized. Right. But as people began to argue and to try to discern the truth of the faith, Catholic has accepted a capital letter. And in fact, if we are ever going to return to the full union of the Church, we may call ourselves Roman Catholics with a capital R because we are one of the rites of the Catholic communion. There are many rites within the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic is the largest of those rites. But if we wanted to capitalize the R, it would be one thing. But Catholic must be done in such a way that has this attitude, that we will be willing to listen to other Christians and to accept the balance that is necessary for Catholic life. Much of the division of the Church that ecumenism is working at comes from the fact that people were not willing to listen, both within the Roman Catholic hierarchy and because of the historical factors of their day. And so, ecumenism for us is a willingness to re-listen to the people that we had said anathema to, a willingness to sit down and talk and pray and listen to each other, and to find out truly where we do stand 400 years later. And that is for us the first step. And I think that as we do this, those, those groups are sponsored through the Roman hierarchy, and it's a very important first step for Christians to sit down and, and listen to each other. The step that comes after that is to find out if, is to study together to find out if they really are in keeping with the scriptures, that the Roman church has corruption. You know that the church is not opposed to dealing with what it considers to be corruption, and there has historically been corruption within the Catholic church. Matter of fact, one of the things that the Mormon religion is built on, you know, is that the Catholic hierarchy became corrupted, and uh, so it would be foolish and unhistorical to admit to say that there was no corruption. So we're willing to deal with that as well. Uh, I don't I, know if that answers your question or not. Uh, Bart, you want to jump in? Well, there. Vatican II's uh, number one priority is eventual reunion, organic merger or union with the Church of Rome. However, this would have there, there are groups that are doing it at the expense of scripture. Uh, the, the groups of <laughs> long, opinion, right? uh, well, it's just reality. Uh, all one has to do is read and study. For example, your WCC groups, your NCC groups, they are promoting a unity in the dark at the expense of scripture. They're we're, we're promoting. Not member, we're not a member of those groups. No, I know, but in time, perhaps you will be, because after all, these churches are closer to Rome than Jerusalem. And yet in the book, in the epistle uh, to the Galatians, Paul says, Jerusalem is the mother of us all, not Rome. And uh, uh, you see, uh, the Catholicism does not need renewing. It does not need re Reformation. It needs to oh, repent. It does. However, it will not put aside pagan purgatory or the idolatrous mass or salvation by works. And my friend Doug, if you don't think that Catholicism promotes salvation by works, it doesn't. Then you study her her books because Roman Catholicism exposes Roman Catholicism. Right here, I have a little booklet right here. Are Catholics saved? By a well-known charismatic uh, university professor, he breaks makes it very clear that the sacraments uh, have a part, especially baptism and the Eucharist, 
in his plan of salvation. So, I mean, there's so much double talk, uh, not necessarily on your part, but those who stand with the Church of Rome. There's, I stand with the you Church have of Rome. The, the, well, I did too at one time until I had to humble myself on the authority of Scripture. As long as you allow the system to interpret the Scripture instead of vice versa, then you will stand with Roman Catholicism. But the issue really is not your church is wrong, we're, we're right. The authority yeah, of Scripture. That is kind the of authority, the, <laughs> the, the authority of Scripture. That's it. The authority of Scripture. But Rome rejects the supreme authority of Scripture. She has to, politically. She's beyond the point of no return. And so she has an ecumenical council to uh, just to make... Uh, to set a climate whereby other churches will begin to amalgamate. And they are beginning to amalgamate. Look at uh, the Episcopal groups and your Anglican groups and Lutheran groups. You will never have the Wisconsin Synod or the Missouri Synod merge with Roman Catholicism. However, you will, you will have some other Lutheran groups merge because they too have a very defective view of Scripture. I've seen this, sure. Doug, uh, coming from a, a different perspective. I'm not a, a, a former Roman Catholic or anything like that, but coming from my perspective. The groups that I see dialoguing, seriously, are the groups that have abandoned the strong affirmation of the inerrancy and infallibility of the Word of God and its authority as an inspired Word. And... Uh, take it from someone who deals with a lot of groups that have other sources of authority. That is the first step. Any, any sense of being able to say, well, and this is where we started, you know, nearly two hours ago, this is where we started, and it's come full circle, and it has to. Because if what you said, Doug, is right, and that is that the, the teaching magisterium of the church, through its traditions, has the authority to interpret scripture and to teach scripture and no one else does then you have some place to stand but I do not feel that biblically in the New Testament we can substantiate that type of idea and when we examine even if even if we leave that issue off leave that issue off let's examine the statements made by the magisterium of what certain verses mean I think that just this morning as I was reading through the, the canons of decrees some of the passages that were utilized to support certain points could not contextually or linguistically be twisted far enough to support the point being made. So if we just want to leave the whole argument of does the New Testament say that there's going to be this traditional uh, realm of, of revelation and it, or does it not, if we just leave that and say, okay, you say it does, we say it doesn't, let's examine what that traditional realm of revelation has said relevant to the scriptures and find out if that's if that's really accurate and I think uh, when you come to the acid test at that point uh, has the Pope has the magisterium has the the leadership of the church been true to the scriptures in their meaning in their context in their historical background in the languages in which they are written I think the answer that I have seen and I'm not an expert at the answer I have seen is no um, and that would be a good uh, you know a good indication to me that, uh, I don't that's quite a understand you know on that. No, I do not believe that, that what the Church of Rome has said certain passages of Scripture means could have ever possibly been what the author of that passage uh, intended it to mean. The interpretation of the magisterium relevant to justification and salvation and Mary and things like that uh, I find to be uh, extremely defective in comparing that to what the Scriptures themselves are saying, their context, their background, their language, and the areas like that. Perhaps it might be helpful for understanding to know that the Catholic Church uses what is called the literal sense, the literalistic sense, and a mystical sense. Mm -hmm. And that the literalistic sense is not so often used or usable. And I think this is not just Roman Catholic theologians either, scripture scholars, but the literal sense that people look for is what the author was really trying to say also within the Catholic Church are used phrases that take that particular phrase and make no claim for it to be its primary meaning but are a scriptural reflection that is, if you want to use the word mysticism, 
that reflects upon what God was doing in that particular case and compares it to someplace else. Mm -hmm. You know, I can just give you one very good example of that. It says in the psalm, he has not done this for any other nation. And that refers to the giving of the law to the Jewish people. Well, in the liturgy for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, that phrase is used in the liturgy. He has not done this for any other nation. And it is a reference to the to the tilma that is, is placed in the Basilica in Mexico City. Now, there's nobody in the Catholic Church who believes that that scripture passage referred to that tilma in the literal interpretation of scripture. But we are used to using in our tradition not only the literal sense, but also a mystical sense of using that to say, as God did that, then God works today. So that, I don't know if that would help, but it... it Somewhat, but when you are enunciating a dogmatic canon and decree right. in theology, and you say this passage supports this, I would hope that at that point the mystic meaning uh, would not be utilized. And not only that, I would strongly uh, object to its utilization because I can mysticize about any any passage I want to and come up with almost any meaning I want to if I if I want to. But if I deal with the passage on the basis of the passage itself, its language, its structure, right, it's, the syntax of it's uh, obviously much more important. And when you deal with that, relevant to the, the doctrines of, of Rome, uh, the, the doctrines that separate us. I mean, if anyone has gotten anything else out of the program, they know that there are doctrines that separate us. Um, that is where I, I, I feel that the, the uh, teaching of the magisterium is, is uh, terribly in error and could be demonstrated to be so. And again, we come back to this issue of authority. What is the authority? If one is willing to accept, and, and I'm sort of summing up here, if one's willing to accept an authority over Scripture or by Scripture, next to Scripture, mm -hmm. one, I believe, can logically find some type of rational answer for almost any teaching of the organization that comes from that. Honestly, I, and I think, I think you've done an excellent job of doing that, and believe me, I've talked to people who have represented many other organizations who have done the same thing, who have, who have said, yes, we accept the Bible, but it can only be interpreted relevant to what our group says is the interpretation. And I read from, I believe earlier, I read from Trent, that says that exact thing, that, that the interpretation that, that is the ultimate interpretation, mystic or not, is that which is provided by the teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church. I have talked to many people who can make some sort of a, of a, of a consistency out of their position when they're allowed that liberty. But that is what is, to me, so significant about what I would term biblical Christianity. And that is, I am not allowed that liberty. I am not allowed any variance whatsoever in my life and in my interpretation from what the Bible says. And I, As you interpret. And, and I am responsible for developing the highest interpretive skills that I can. For me, that has involved learning both Hebrew and Greek. It has involved uh, studying the grammar of those passages, the, 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 the history, the cultural background, the whole nine yards. Now, not everyone can do that, but for me, if I'm going to engage in, in, in shows such as this, then I think that's necessary. And I cannot simply, when I come across a passage of Scripture, when I, when I have interpreted it and exegeted it, I cannot avoid its clear teaching no matter what the situation might be, even if it impinges upon some tradition that I might hold. And all of us have traditions. But I think the big difference between us is that my tradition is completely sacrificable to the scripture because I do not claim an ecclesiastical or um, structural unity going all the way back uh, to Paul or the apostles. My tradition that I hold is not infallible and I have no one above me who can sit and speak ex cathedra and speak to me infallible truth. Uh, my, my infallible ex cathedra speaker is the Bible. Ex cathedra is speaking from the chair uh, when the Pope actually speaks upon a matter of doctrine and, and speaks upon it in an official manner that it is infallible. That I think is, again, we've come full circle. That I think is where, where we're separated that time. 
Um, I am running out of time. I'd like to thank both of you for being here. Uh, Bart, for, for joining with me. Uh, the book is Pilgrimage from Rome. Thank and you. Uh, if you want to get hold of that or need to get a hold of Bart Brewer at all, just contact Alpha Omega Ministries. We'll put you in touch. Thank you. Uh, Doug, um, uh, the program, The Shepherd's Voice, that's how you can get in hold of you. Uh, either that or through St. Catherine's, I'd imagine. And, okay.